Um, it's really an honor to join four esteemed people who have been working in very different ways, but all towards a really similar goal of what does it mean to actually live not just the best version of yourself, to but overcome some kind of structural injustices that we see and do not see at the same time. And so what I'm hoping we can accomplish in the next hour together is um, have a deep conversation and after you know, basic statements and introductions, we're gonna open it a little for us to kind of further the conversation for everyone to get what does it mean to be Muslim in America today? What does it mean to be a minority community? Are we a minority community and who defines what community is? Um, and so I'm gonna begin by introducing those who need no introduction, um, but start with uh, all the way at the end, um, Sheikh Dawood Yassin, who's um, the Muslim Life Service TRIPS coordinator at the Tucker Foundation. Um, he provides spiritual and religious support and offers educational seminars for Muslims in Dartmouth College and residents in the greater Hanover area. He also works to foster understanding and dialogue among diverse campus groups and communities. Um, he's also an ISF recipient, and as a board member, he's one of my favorite and most proud uh, recipients of the Islamic Scholarship Fund. I know it's the second time I mention it today, but uh, all the information is still available outside the MSA. Um, our second speaker, um, Sheikh Omar Sleiman, I know we're in Texas, he needs no introduction, um, but is the founder and president of the Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research and an adjunct professor in the Graduate Liberal Arts Program at Southern Methodist University. He's also a resident scholar at the Valley Ranch Islamic Center and co-chair of the Faith Forward Dallas um, and Thanksgiving Square. Um, and Sheikh Omar is really, for our community, at the forefront or the face of many of the battles that we have been struggling against. And I always say, whenever I turn on TV and there's a community gathering and there's those who are speaking and those who are unseen, you see Sheikh Omar's face there as well. Um, third, we have Abdul Sayed. Um, Abdul Sayed is probably one of our community's proudest accomplishments. He ran for governor of the state of Michigan and came in second in the Democratic primary. He's a physician, health commissioner, a Rhodes Scholar, someone whose entire life has been committed to alleviating the in social injustices that the everyday person experiences in the health situation in, 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 in Michigan. And finally, and last but definitely not least, we have Sean King, and it's really an honor and a privilege to have you here. He attended Morehouse College in Atlanta where he majored in history. After graduating, he was a research assistant for Morehouse history professor Anton Hornsby. Hornsby, sorry, and after graduating, was a high school civics teacher for about a year and then became a motivational speaker. Um, he was an he was then a pastor at Total Grace Christian Center in DeKalb County, Georgia. In March 2010, while still a pastor, he founded a home in Haiti.org as a subsidiary of Courageous Church and used eBay and Twitter to raise $1.5 million to send to tents to Haiti after the 2010 Haiti earthquake. In 2005, 15, he wrote the self-help book, The Power of 100. In October of, 2000, of 2015, the New York Daily News announced that, he was hi that they were hiring King to the new position of senior justice writer. And I believe now you write for The Intercept. Um, and again, someone who is the face of most of the um, anti-injustices that we see today. And so I really want to thank all of them, not just for joining us, but for ISNA for putting, or MSA for putting them all together on the same panel. And so what the title of the session is, Nations and Tribes, I actually want to problematize this title in a way to think about, it's not just in the traditional sense of nations and tribes created to know one another, but there is an on-purpose creation of communities of tribalism today in the United States. Um, so I didn't introduce myself, did I? So my name is uh, Dalia Fahmi. I'm a professor of political science at Long Island University and a senior fellow at the Center for Global Policy in Washington, D.C. And this year I'm a visiting scholar at um, the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights and the UNESCO Chair at Rutgers University. And, and one of the advisors to the Yaqeen Institute. Um, yes, I'm, that's on my bio, actually. <laughs> um, but 
one of the things that we are starting to see, not just in social science research, but really in communications research, is how technology, primarily things like Facebook and Twitter, but how these organizations, for example, like Cambridge Analytica, Angry Birds, Words with Friends, all of these things that are gathering data on us, are an on-purpose project to create a level of mistrust amongst us, to create a level of identity that is forced on us because we are oppressed communities. Um, tribalism is not a return to an authentic identity. Tribalism is when persecuted communities come together and think, I need to gather around something because everything is stacked against me. And it leads to a moment where not only do we not know who we are, we don't know what we're defining ourselves against, but it also leads to a moment where that technology is causing a level of apathy in community. And so we revert to what's coming into the literature as a level of tribalism. And so that's what I want to talk about, and that's what I want to focus on, is that how is it in this climate where there is technology and social injustice and Islamophobia creating identities for us that we are accepting that might not be the identities that are authentic to ourselves? And so that's the kind of broader frame of the talk. And so I'm going to ask every, every, every person, scholar we have here, a targeted question and then open it up to everyone to please chime in. And so the first is to Dr. Abdurrahman. Um, you just ran for governor in one of the country's most populous states, one that's struggling economically, socially, structurally. You did it all as a physician, an advocate, a health commissioner, a new father, and you're in your early 30s. You know that you were opposed, and we all know that you are opposed to not just have a robust political future, inshallah, but you have probably a unique experience to show us what you learned, not just on this campaign trail, but what you learned about America, what you learned about identity, about struggles of the everyday American, and how you did it, not just as um, an Arab American, but leading with, I'm a Muslim. Well, thank you for the uh, question. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. All right, guys, we're talking about trying to, you know, exert ourselves in the world. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. I, um, I really appreciate the question. I had the privilege on my uh, campaign, 18 months, to travel all over the state of Michigan. Now, Michigan's a pretty big state, 10 million people. And you meet all kinds of people, and they ask you questions about who you are and, 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 and how you're coming to this thing. And uh, I'll give you just a little quick story, and then, and then I want to comment on, on, on where we are and, and where I hope we're going. So the first time anybody ever told me to run for office, it was at my college graduation. And I was uh, uh, privileged and, and blessed to be chosen uh, to give the commencement speech on behalf of the graduating students at the University of Michigan. I was the valedictorian in my class. And um, the main speaker who anybody, including my own parents, went to go listen to that day uh, was President Bill Clinton. So I give my speech. My parents, for the first time in their lives, clapped for me. It was fantastic. <laughs> and, um, and then Bill Clinton gave his speech. He said some really nice things uh, about me in his speech. My parents clapped again. And, um, and then afterwards, I'm getting ready to go, and President Clinton is in a group of people, and I didn't want to bother the man. I'm a good Midwestern boy. And so I start walking out, and I feel a tap on my shoulder. Who do you think it is? It's Bill Clinton. If you ever met Bill Clinton, he's got this ability to stare into your soul. That was like one of his big political skills. And so he starts staring into my soul, and he asks me a question that people don't usually ask a graduating senior going to medical school, which was, why are you going to medical school? First thing that came on my mind was, well, you know, I'm brown. I'm Muslim, that's what we do. <laughs> but beyond that, I said, look, I, I love people and I love science, and this is how I want to serve. He said, son, you know, you've got a gift for communicating, and, and maybe someday you'll run for office. And I literally looked at him, and I said, Mr. President, I really appreciate you saying that. My name's got 11 letters in it. <laughs> that's just my first name. <laughs> people like me don't get to run for office. A year later, I got to watch a man by the name of Barack Hussein Obama get elected president. And the fact of the matter is, it was the first time I ever even saw myself in a politician. Now, I've got a lot of differences with President Obama's policies. But the reality of it is, is that his dad immigrated from Africa. My dad immigrated from a different part of Africa. He was raised in a mixed household. I was raised by my father and my stepmom, born and raised in the middle of the state of Michigan. 
Everybody thought he was Muslim. I'm actually Muslim. <laughs> when I decided to run, I thought it was about as crazy as everybody else did. 32, Muslim American, doctor, no previous experience. But I'll tell you actually why I decided to run more than anything else. It's because of my uncle Rick. Yeah, I've got an uncle named Rick. <laughs> uncle Rick uh, is one of my favorite people in the world. He was the guy who would take us snowmobiling in the winters, take us, us water skiing in the summers, taught me what a mustard pretzel was. He um, goes hunting every fall, and he always lear he learned early on how to prepare the venison halal so that our family could eat it. And he would make us venison burgers and venison jerky. My Uncle Rick does not hate Muslims, not even close. Who do you think my Uncle Rick voted for in 2016? Donald Trump. You know why? Not because he hates Muslims, but because in 2008, he lost his trucking business. And in the ensuing eight years, he watched as this recovery in the economy didn't include people like him in places like Gratiot County, Michigan, where my mom grew up. And so for him, after voting for Obama twice, voted for Donald Trump. You gotta imagine the awkward conversation he and his Muslim nephew share. Right now, it is easy for us to look at this world and say, when we see Donald Trump on TV and we know that he won an election, that people must feel the way he says they feel. And the reality of the matter is that there's a very small group of people who have a big vested interest in telling us that we don't belong here. They speak very, very loudly, but there are not many of them. And I remember instances on the trail. I was one time, I was at some random gas station in the middle of Michigan, and I see this guy get out of this big pickup truck. He's got this big beard, he's got a cut off t shirt, and he looks at me and says, Hey, are you Abdul Al Sayyid? I was like, Oh, God. <laughs> yes, yes, sir, I am. He said, I cannot wait to vote for you in August. The reality of the matter is, is that most people don't pay attention to Islam in the way that we have to pay attention to Islam. Why? Because for us it's existential. We worry about what is said about us because it has to do with us. But most of the people out there, however much this small group who manufactures Islamophobia want us to believe it, there are very, very few people who even know what Muslims are, to be quite honest. And every day we have the opportunity to redefine what that is if we are willing to break through the assumption that we have about what they believe and to go meet them in their own communities and have conversations about the things that we all care about, which by the way are the same. Whether or not people have access to a job, whether or not they have access to health care, whether or not their schools are good places for their kids or they're being exposed to toxins in the water or breathing clean air. Those are things that all of us care about. And if we're willing to dignify people eye to eye, we have the opportunity to formulate what it is that a Muslim is in their mind. Alhamdulillah, we ran our race, we didn't win. <laughs> but a friend of mine sat me down and said, you know what, there's something crazy about what you just did. I said, what is it? He's like, you got 340,000 people in a state like Michigan to vote for a guy named Abdurrahman Muhammad al Sayyid. <laughs> but, the, but the thing about it is that we would assume based on what we think the world is that that's impossible. It clearly is not. And it is on us to face the biases that exist in the world that a few perpetuate and to be willing to do what is in our prophetic tradition. Smile, engage, look somebody in the eye, have the empathy to ask about what their world is and do the work of fixing it. And I'll finish on one last thought. In the end, for us, our responsibility, it moves beyond what people think about us. I was raised as a proud Muslim and American. My mom, Jackie, who raised me, white American, she never had to deal with growing up in a moment of Islamophobia or being questioned. She was a white woman growing up with no obvious difference to anybody else. And she always used to say, if you want people to believe in you, you got to believe in yourself. Now, what is our self? We, as Muslims, believe that we have a responsibility to build justice. And justice isn't just us, it's justice for everyone. And that responsibility means that we have to be of and in the world doing the work of justice building. And if we are going to allow other people's biases to dictate the frame within which we can actually do that work, then we've limited ourselves.
And I know that our responsibility to justice is far bigger than that. And so, to me, the thing I always thought was the idea that as a Muslim, I believed, seek justice, that is the closest thing to taqwa. And as an American, ideals like those that tell us that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal. There is no mutual exclusion between our Muslim identities and our American identities, and I think it's time for us to be willing to embrace both. Sheikh Omar, right here in Texas, um, a little over a year ago, a 15-year-old boy named Jordan Edwards was killed, shot and killed by a police officer. And just about 10 days ago, the police officer that killed him um, was sentenced. And people celebrated as if it was victory. We're coming at a time where we're celebrating what should be taken for granted, right? Justice being served. What can Muslims, and I know that you and Sean King were part of this campaign, but what can Muslims um, and Islam as a religion uniquely offer the discourse surrounding racism and oppression? How do you view your role as a religious scholar in engaging in this arena? Okay, so first of all, I want to, uh, I, I think that the conviction of Roy Oliver in the murder of Jordan Edwards was historic in many different ways. And I remember when Sean came to Dallas with, uh, at that time, Cornell Brooks, Stephen Green, the NAACP, and um, there were so many vigils, so many demonstrations, and every single place you went, you saw Jordan's picture and his smile. And I wrote this the other day that what I think was so powerful about you know, Jordan, and there was a, there's a connection to Emmett Teal, uh, it, the conviction actually came on the anniversary of the murder of Emmett Teal. Emmett Teal's mother had the courage and the bravery to open the casket and to show America what they did to her son. Jordan's parents didn't have to open a casket. They just carried themselves in the beautiful, graceful manner that they did, and they just let Jordan's smile speak for itself. And all of us fell in love with him. I mean, I remember going to the very first vigil at his school and looking at the kids that were around him, and you could tell that that crying at that vigil in Ball Springs was different, that he managed to touch everyone around him. And so we have to understand that police brutality, that in this case, when Roy Oliver pulled that trigger, and I can't imagine what Roy Oliver, who was, uh, you know, who, who pledged to some sort of Nazi club in middle school, who was a, who's an Iraq vet, who probably murdered many Iraqi children as well without any type of conscience. When he pulled that trigger on Jordan Edwards, he pulled that trigger thinking that there was no way that he would be held accountable. Now, the sentencing only came for 15 years and some sick logic that 15 years for 15 years. Jordan was 15, so he's sentenced to 15. He'll, he'll probably be out earlier than that on parole. But I want everyone to understand that the whole world was robbed of Jordan Edwards. We were robbed as Dallas of Jordan Edwards. We were robbed as Texas of Jordan Edwards. And looking at o his parents, I mean, Sean, you played pool with Odell, and, and uh, these are some of the most beautiful people that I'd ever met in my entire life. And so I think that in such a polarized time, it's important for us to see each other in one another. We have to, I have to, when I look at Odell, I see a father. I, I, the love that he has for his kids, the, the time that he's putting in extra hours to be able to pay for the, the psychiatric bills for his kids because his kids couldn't sleep with the lights off anymore because they saw Jordan's head blown to pieces in front of them. The, the way that he tried to hold himself composed and showed up to protests and vigils even though he didn't want to speak, I saw a dad. I saw myself as a father in him. And so let me start off with this, that Islam calls to fitrah, which means your natural disposition, our humanity. It has to start at the basics of humanity. Unless I see Odell as a father and Jordan as my son, I'm failing in this cause. This is not just some political cause. This is not just meant to be about police brutality. This is about a father, a mother, a son, and brothers, and people who, whose lives, and you know, ambiguous loss, have lost a significant portion of their lives based upon this murder that took place, this act of terror 
that took place. And you know what really broke me? I mean, I went to, I, I was, I just got back from Hajj on Wednesday, and I went by the courthouse, and I was seeing the sentences, the sentencing phase. And you see Roy Oliver, who pulled that trigger, has a three-year-old son with autism. So how many, how many people's lives did he destroy by doing that? So we have to recognize the human element of all of these tragedies and stop seeing people as objects, as distant creatures. And so it starts there. What can Islam do and what role do I see as a religious scholar in this entire, th in, in this entire uh, uh, cause? Uh, you know, that's, that's a multi-layered question. I'll start with this. What Islam teaches us is that knowledge of God leads to knowledge of self, leads to knowledge of the other. I just, you know, I literally, a few days ago, was just looking out at the sea of people in Hajj and just mesmerized, as I always am, looking at Tawaf, looking at the people in their same garments from all over the world, speaking different languages, but looking with complete adoration at the symbols and the things that remind them of Allah, that remind them of God. What happened to Malcolm X? Malcolm used the words, he said, Islam has a proven solution for racism. Proven solution. I want us to understand, as Muslims, we are the only religion, now every religion has a doctrine of equality, and you can derive anti-racism. There is no other religion in the world that has explicit anti-racism scripture. We do, and it's not one verse. Quran, Sunnah, it can be derived from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, from equality, from basic humanity. You have explicit anti-racism scripture in your religion that you can draw from. You have Bilal in your religion, a man who was discriminated against, a man who represented the most downtrodden of society, a man who was exploited, who did not have a tribe, who was black as they come, and through Islam, in the most racist society, or one of the most racist societies and tribalistic societies that's been known to man, he's the only man that ever stood on, to on top of the Kaaba and called out, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, and was elevated through Islam. You have a proven solution. You have a comprehensive message. Malcolm connected the dots between monotheism and the oneness of man. Malcolm connected the dots between the knowledge of one's own self and the knowledge of the rights of others. And so I think it's important for us to look at what our religion provides in terms of a framework for how to deal with the problem of racism. I think that activism as a whole, and I was, it's funny because I was having this conversation with Sean, the, 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 I think that, you know, I, he mentioned this online, getting an award from the Shabazz Center from the spot that Malcolm was assassinated. I was like, I don't, if I never receive another award in my life, I'm good. And that's, that's what he said as well, um, you know, that night. When you look at activism today, number one, a lot of it is performative. People show up to a protest, take a selfie, and they're nowhere to be found after that and they wait for the next protest, and then they judge their attendance based upon how many people have clicked going already on Facebook, whether they're gonna show up or not. That's fake, it's performative, it's not gonna get us anywhere. That's number one. Number two, it's incoherent. It's not rooted. A lot of times the people that are engaging in activism themselves are not rooted, nor are there any principles to root the activism itself. From an ideological perspective, uh, from, a, uh, uh, from, from the perspective of, of methodology, from the perspective of continuity. So it's important for us to not just provide Islamic language or religious language, but instead to draw deep from our tradition. And the last thing I'll say on, on this note, if you speak to the families of Malcolm and Ali, one thing you realize is that these men were deeply spiritual and the way that they were able to face what they faced was because of the night prayer that no one saw. Mm -hmm. Malcolm went to Umrah, he went to Hajj in, in, uh, in, in, the, in, early, in April of 1964. He went again to Umrah, he went to Mecca again in September the same year and said no cameras, no media, didn't let anyone cover it. And then he was planning to go to Hajj again in March of 1965. What he got from there 
gave him so much to be able to persist. Muhammad Ali used to, Imam Zaid actually shared this with me for the first time. Muhammad Ali used to sign uh, like 200 da'wah pamphlets a day or something like that, put his autograph on it because he said if, 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 they, if my autograph's on it, they won't throw it in the garbage. What was, what was the prayer of these men like? What was their spirituality like? What, were, what was fueling them? Because you know what we find now in activism? Burnout. Complete burnout. Because if you yourself are not rooted, this craziness in, in, in Donald Trump's America, that'll, you'll, be out. <laughs> you'll be out in two years, even with just some perform, basic performative activism. You need to have something that grounds you not just ideologically, experientially, and spiritually. Where is your fuel? And so that's what I think uh, the faith can provide for us as well. And as Muslims, we need to draw from that. We have a lot to, uh, to, to spiritually fuel us to be able to deal with a spiritually sick world. So Sean, um, I'm a social scientist. Social scientist, data analysts and communication scholars have been telling us for the past seven years that what a lot of these tech companies are trying to do is not just create divisive issues, but create a sense of tribalism, increasing noise and distraction, promoting fake news, fake stories, so that we not only not know who to trust, but that we ultimately stop trusting. Um, this is not just the so-called Russian playbook. Um, the final step is that we get to a feeling of futility. So a lot of these tech companies, actually this is their objective, that we get to a feeling of futility. But at the same time, when you look at the average lived experience, especially of young people of brown or young people of color, then the feeling that the world is closing in on them, that the odds are stacked against them, the reality of, for example, police brutality and surveillance and the surveillance culture and the surveillance economy, that this is all just not just around the corner, but the everyday lived experience, that structural injustice is real. How do we overcome this? Because on one hand, you have the reality that the odds are stacked against us, but now you also have this great social media technology world that also wants to use the political tool of futility. And so we live in this duality of, yes, there is structural injustice, I feel overwhelmed, but there's the political tool of futility, you should be overwhelmed. And so we become apathetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Here we go. Sorry about that. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for the question. I'm honored to be on this panel with my friends. Um, I, I was speaking to, uh, to some people earlier this afternoon for, for years, I, um, I would read the uh, journalist Ta-Nehisi Coates, and um, his writing was really pessimistic about the state of bigotry and racism and discrimination in America. And for most, I'm 38 years old, and for the majority of my life, I've actually been known as a very optimistic person. And I would always read uh, what Coates would write, and I, I was just stumped by his, by the pessimism, and he would admit to this pessimism. I, um, I just couldn't relate to it, and there was a real part of me that thought he was wrong to be so pessimistic. I think a few years ago, I felt like you sounded just a few minutes ago. <laughs> Like, you sounded very optimistic about the state of our country. And as I heard it, I, uh, I admired it. <laughs> I, I had the thought, I, I mean, you did travel all over Michigan, and I had the thought, I hope he saw some things that I did not get to see, and I know that you did. I am actually... Having, having studied some of the systems that we're up against, the not just structural bigotry and racism and discrimination, but even the, the systems of technology that use those things, I'm actually deeply discouraged about the state of our country. And I think that, I think that we underestimated 
in many horrendous ways how, how, how seriously problematic the United States can be. And um, the, the election of Donald Trump, I think, is kind of the manifestation of how disturbing this country is. It's, it's, a, it's a symptom of that problem. I, I, am in, I am encouraged in spite of so much bigotry, so much discrimination, and I don't just mean random acts of bigotry and discrimination, but how it is often deeply embedded into our systems and structures, into our economy. Even though I'm, I'm very discouraged by that, I, I don't accept responsibility for those systems, and let me unpack what I mean. Like, I don't, I didn't help build those systems, but I do take responsibility for how we organize against them. And what I see is that a lot of people who mean most of us in this room harm out-organized us, out-strategized us, out-thought us. They also outspent us. Um, last, uh, last week, um, my friend uh, Andrew Gillum, who was running for governor of Florida, um, won, the, won the Democratic nomination, and that was a huge victory. But I, yeah, you can clap for that. But I looked at the numbers, and at the end of the night, even though he won the Democratic nomination, more Republicans voted that night than Democrats. And so it was, it was a victory, yes. It was historic, yes. But had that actually been election night, he would have lost by several hundred thousand votes. And I'm not even just talking about partisan politics, I'm talking about how we organize within our own communities. I think there are deep, meaningful ways that we can organize ourselves against the ways that we're being duped and played. And, and let me give a couple of examples. Um, on multiple election days, for instance, I see a sign here for Beto for Senate. Uh, on multiple election days, I get phone calls from really informed people who are about to vote and they tell me, Sean, I have no idea who to vote for. And so what they end up doing is they may end up voting all Democrat or all down one party line. I've even had, and there's no shame in this, I've even had people say, uh, I read the names and voted for people whose names sounded nice. I don't know about, I mean, that's not a smart way, because nice is, is a subjective uh, way to vote. Or some people say, I just voted for all the women. But what they, what, they, what, what they basically reveals is that there are all of these essential positions. They have no idea who, who the people are, what they stand for. And we have to own that. Like, we have to take responsibility for the fact that we aren't informed enough to know who to vote for in every particular position. You and I talked just before the, before the panel began, and... This challenge of misinformation, of bad information, is very, very real. And I, I, wanna, I wanna advise at least one really basic strategy uh, to, to fight against it. I don't know that I trust any one particular news company, not even the companies that I have worked for. I think it's best if you can probably develop, one, develop a skill, and then I'll say the second thing in a minute. Develop a skill for you to be able to discern the truth for yourself. Do not assume that almost any headline that you read, don't, don't take it for face value and assume that it is absolutely true. Even if it comes from your favorite newscaster or voice, sometimes you have to dig deeper than that. But one thing that I do, while I don't trust any one company, I have found individual voices 
that I pretty much trust. And I, I labor very hard to be one of those voices for, for you. And I get people every single day who tell me, Sean, when I'm trying to understand something about injustice in the world, I try to see what you're saying about it. And, and I try to be accurate every single day. Find those individual voices. And I hope even, even us on the panel and know that we labor and work every day to be accurate, but understand that there is so much misinformation that what you, what you may have heretofore assumed to be accurate on first read may not be true at all. And uh, like my, my dear mother, uh, my kids watch uh, wrestling and my mother is, is now on Facebook and several times she saw articles saying that the wrestler John Cena had died and he, had, he is still alive and one time she panicked and called me and said, don't tell, my son's name is Ezekiel, we call him Easy. Don't tell Easy, but John Cena died. <laughs> I told her, I said, Mom, I said, Mom, it's just like a, a Facebook joke that people are doing. And she couldn't process that there was an article, because it looked real. And she couldn't believe that John Cena was still alive. And, but it gets... That's a funny one, but it's often not that funny. It's often dangerous and destructive, and it often particularly preys on our communities. And so hopefully you can find individual voices that you trust. But I, still, I do still have hope because I'm not convinced that we have done our best organizing. I'm not convinced that we've thrown our best solutions at our worst problems. I'm not convinced, I, I, you and I campaigned together and I, 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 le I leaned over and told him a, a few seconds ago, I'm still so hurt that he is not the nominee. I know that you're not even supposed to say that to somebody right before they speak, but <laughs> when I was so encouraged by him running because for, my, for, for 10 years I have felt like the best leaders in our country aren't in politics because they see the systems and like, I don't want anything to do with that. They, they go into business, they go into different avenues, but they stay away from politics because it's so toxic. And so when I saw you run, I was so encouraged because I feel, and I still do, I felt like one of the best leaders in our country said, I'm gonna try to make a difference with this system. So I don't feel like we've thrown our best leaders and our best solutions and our best organizing at our worst problems. I don't feel like we've spent enough money on our worst problems. I don't feel like we have put enough time in not just showing up for the protest, but enough depth yeah, into our most sophisticated problems. And, and if we had done all of those things and we're still losing, I think I would be discouraged. But I, I think there is still so much room for us to do better. That, that, that room for us to do better is what leaves me hope. And, um, and I'll, I'll, I do wanna close with this. Um, I, I, I joke sometimes, but a lot of people think I am a Muslim. Uh, now, that, now that I've grown out my beard, it's definitely increased that. And, and, I, and when I was detained by uh, the TSA at the airport, that definitely increased my Muslim credibility. Um, but they often, it's not that, most people, I, and I get letters every day from people harassing me because they think I'm a Muslim for, I think for two reasons. One, because so many of my friends are Muslims, but two, because they see me fighting against Islamophobia and, and bigotry that people experience every day. And people, and it's, I think it's a sad sign in America, people struggle to believe that someone who is not a Muslim could care so much about Muslims. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's a, I think it's a, it's, but that's, I'm disturbed by that, that, that people think you must be a part of one group to care about that group so much. And, um, 
you know, it's part of why I love the organizing work that we do. There are, there are people who have asked me if you were African American. Because they assume if you're fighting against racism and police brutality, they, that's, that's their assumption. And, and I love that we are doing this intersectional work where we are fighting for each other um, out, of, out of our love for one another and because we see that we are better when we do that. And uh, I think we're just scratching the surface of that and we could do so much better in the years ahead. Thank you. Imam Daoud, um, what's happening in the world today reminds me of a quote by uh, the great Marxist philosopher Antonio Gramsci, and he says, the old world is dying, the new world is struggling to be born, and today is the time of monsters. How do we make sense of what's happening today? How do we wrap our heads around it? What is the most critical lesson that we should be learning that we might not be learning? And how is it possible to move beyond this moment of so-called monsters and think about this new world? Inshallah, inshallah. Thank you for, for that question. I think that the question brings me to a place which really, uh, focusing on what Sean said, that we haven't put the best version of ourselves at the worst problems that we see. In my opinion, and what I've seen over the years in the work that I've been engaged in, and is that, because there's a, there's a prelude to that, and that prelude is that we have to become the best version of ourselves. And I think the reason that, that, that we, when, 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 when Sheikh Omar mentioned about that Islam has an answer to it, I feel that as well from our spiritual tradition, we have an answer to that as well too. A couple of things I just want to mention here, Sean, it's really interesting you say that, that now you're being pulled in by TSA because you're being assumed that you're a Muslim. I've been pulled in by them for the last 15 years consistently on every flight, domestic and international, except for the last two flights. So maybe some, <laughs> so this, uh, you had to pass the, pass, the, pass the energy over to you. Um, so I just thought that was interesting as you said that. Well, Sean mentioned something, and you kept mentioning in his words here, about this hope, and for me, that, that's the reality. It's such a reality for me that we named our fourth daughter Hope, my wife and I. So, so, and it's really interesting about where we're at as a community in that myself and my wife, we spent my wife nine years in Damascus as a student of knowledge, of Islamic knowledge, myself five. We were met there, we married. I've served as an imam. I've worked in the community both internationally and domestic. And, and the question came, had we left Islam? because we had named our daughter Hope. And we were very specific in choosing the name. Now, I lost the discussion because I wanted to name her Sky and really flip this thing. <laughs> because how many Sama do you know? Right? It would be okay if her name was Sama, but as a Muslim African American, I couldn't name my daughter Sky and that wouldn't be okay. So we named her Hope because of Raja. Now, that's to say that there is work that we need to do to bring us to that place to be the best version of ourselves, Sean. And for me, I feel that's the essence of our tradition, both from our tradition and from the tradition of Isa, salam, from Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him. That when he walked by a carcass of a sheep and the companions of him who are taking this time and being taught by him complain about an odor and a look and other things, he has one thing to say. Look how beautifully white the teeth are. And to me, that's the optimism of our prophet. And to me, that's giving over to the realities that are beyond this plane. And that, to me, is when, when the call went out for Standing Rock, and the call was, join us in prayerful protest. I said, sign me up. And I went to my supervisor and I said, I want to bring our kids to this protest. And we loaded up the van from California and we drove them to North Carolina. And we sat on that plane for five days and we chopped wood and we served food and we 
separated donations and we did these other things, but the whole premise was that every morning as the First Nation engaged in their prayer, we were also engaged in our prayer. And as people began to see these threads, it was similar to what Sean said, like, wait a minute, who are you? You're Muslim? And you're on this plain of North Dakota in 20 degree weather, breaking the ice to make will do in the river, to wash up, to pray? Yes. Why? Because if I don't believe that that's where my strength comes from, then I need to pack up my tent, my sleeping bag, the van, and we all need to drive back to California now because we got it twisted. The reality of this thing is that this affair is not an affair of this world, first and foremost, and it's not an affair that we have control over. However, that is not for us to be fatalistic to say that we don't have to work. Because that is the same type of teus that is known in our tradition, right? That this idea of, help me out here, Sheikh Omar, I'm having a moment, teus is the despair. That's the separation of Satan and Adam in our tradition. Satan despairs of God's mercy. And from that, he becomes an ingrate to all of the beautiful things that are happening and all of the beautiful people that are there. And it's a really interesting because, Sean, on that trip to, to, to North Carolina, we stopped at a gas station in Wyoming. And here we are with hijabed sisters and bearded brown men and the man asks where we're going and we begin to talk about it and he's this is pre-election and he talks about that the state that a quarter of the population lost their jobs because there were promises about coal and renewable energy and other things that were supposed to happen that never happened and his wife is out of a job he lost his car he's working at a gas station now so it's not because you know, as we were saying, ideologically people are aligned with that. There are other realities, but how do we see through that? And I think that's the message that I want to say, that if it's about monsters, then we have to be with the one who is the protector of monsters, both spiritually and physically. That's just the message that I'm thinking about and what I see over and over and over again. Because to me, this is a Badr moment. This is a moment where the Prophet ﷺ raises his hands and weeps to God. Where Abu Bakr anhu says that the tears are dripping from his beard. And I don't only want to put it into that realm. But my point is that that realm is the same realm that Malcolm drew from, rahimahullah, God have mercy on him. That Muhammad Ali drew from, God have mercy on him. And Dr. King drew from, and on, and Gandhi, and on, and on, and on, and on. These are the people that are showing us the way that this hope is very real and that if we give over to that other side, it's, it's very easy to give up. And that's what that ingrate wants from us, is that we will just give up. But if that hope is rightly placed, then we'll understand also that outcomes are not with us. Outcomes are not with us. Our job is to work. And in that work is the victory. And that would ensure that that victory happens is that we will never give up from the work, irrespective of what it looks like. Because then you have the reality of what's a victory and what's a loss. Asa and tukrihu shayin. Perhaps it is that you love something. Or perhaps it is that you detest something. But it is good for you. And perhaps it is that you love something and it is problematic for you. Allah knows and you know not. So when we move to this realm and giving it over, ufawudu umuri ilallah, that I depute my affairs to Allah, then the fact that we are engaged in and of itself is a victory. The fact that we are engaged and we will not give up in and of itself is a victory. Why? Because then you are promised change. You're promised a change in that verse, in Surah Al-Ra'ad, and I don't want to come here to just quote, quote scripture, but the fact is that if it's not at the essence and the foundation of what we're standing upon, then everything else is fleeting. But that promise is that I will not change the condition of a people until they change first what is in themselves. The onus is on us. The onus is on us. Right? And so we have to ask ourselves that question. And we have to know that from that one step that we take, God comes running. What does that look like? To have God come running to your aid. So as we sit here and we hear, mashallah, these, I am honored. 
I'm honored, I'm humbled to be in the shadow of, 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 of everyone on this panel. I say that not in some sort of mubalagha, uh, uh, in some sort of um, uh, hyperbolic speech. I say that with complete sincerity. But I think for us, as a people, the hope that I have seen, as I said, it's the hope in Standing Rock of the prayers that were going up and the call for people to get up. They would say, yeah, oh, oh cousin, they would say. Oh, guests, they would say, First Nations, rise up, pray for God to change this situation. It's the same thing that I saw when we stayed in the home of the pastor in Selma for the two years when we brought our students down there to work with them. In, in, in a place in Camden, uh, uh, Alabama, it's one of the poorest counties in the, in the country, that we were able to learn from a man who met Dr. King and Malcolm. And he said that this whole thing is hope from beginning to end, and it's about God, he said, from beginning to end. And it's the same thing last year when we took our kids to Princeville, North Carolina, the first town in America that was emancipated in 1865, who now live 26 feet below sea level, so whenever it would rain, their crops were washed out and their homes were flooded. Until this day, it still happens. But yet, it's the same optimism and hope and belief in God from their tradition, most of them being Muslim, but then the whole town, because all of the Islamic relief and props to Islamic relief who did the work in that place, they committed to a long-term commitment in that place. So when the people saw monsters as us as Muslims, no, they didn't see that. Because all of us had on Islamic shirts as we were walking through the town of Islamic relief, and people would come up randomly, thank you, thank you. Thank you. They didn't know your ideology. They didn't know your name. They didn't know whatever. They just knew that if people came down here, they came to serve. And if there's anything that you will learn from history in this country, it is that people that have committed themselves to service, that those are the people that were able to rise above the claims that were being made about them. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this gathering. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to have that foundation that allows us to be the best version of ourselves to throw it at the worst things that we are seeing right now. Thank you so much, Imam. So just a conclusion kind of question. This is a MSA young audience. Um, if you could speak to the younger version of you and also these young people, and really think about what they're seeing every day. Um, yes, we had successful people, people run successfully for office, um, but 38% of Americans say they would never vote for a Muslim. Um, yes, there are stories of success, but what we do know is that in, after the Trump election, it wasn't the economic circumstances in the Rust Belt, it was racism that led to the election. When we think about all of the statistics that we know, but really the narratives that our children see on TV, um, especially with the final verdict of the Supreme Court on the Muslim ban. Um, I, Donald J. Trump, call for a complete ban on Muslims, not just the mistrust from, that used to come from the periphery, but now is essentially coming from the core. How do we tell young people? What is the message that you would give the younger version of yourself but young people, in spite of everything they see, in spite of everything they hear. I know in Sheikh Omar's Yaqeen Institute, a study was just released about the internalization of Islamophobia, right? So if Islamophobia is the irrational fear of Islam and Muslims, it's, there's a political objective here, and the political objective is what? That Muslims start to believe that indeed they don't belong. And what we're starting to see is indeed if there's a negative perception of Islam and Muslims in the average American, there's also beginning a negative perception of Islam and Muslims among Muslim youth. And so, how, what, was, what is your message to, again, not just the younger version of yourself, but all the young people in the audience? So, you, we were talking about what, um, what I got to see on the trail. And there, there are two things that, for me, uh, buoy my, my deep hope and optimism, is that I got to see a lot of you. And everywhere I'd go, I'd see these young people who never saw themselves getting engaged into a process. You know, Sean, when you talk about our best and our brightest, um, it's somewhat of a circular thing. If there's no hope, then there's no work. And if there's no work, then there's nothing to hope for. And I'd see people who otherwise would never have gotten involved in any campaign ever dialing phone numbers of random people they have never seen, probably will never meet, 
to have a conversation about our democracy, to have a conversation about our country, to get involved in the system. And I'd see young people enthused and excited and hopeful and optimistic. And that's because almost everybody involved in the campaign coming out of it, when you ask them what the most valuable thing they got out of it was, we didn't win, we lost. I mean, I want you to think about that. We tried something and lost, failed publicly and failed pretty big, was that they got to interact with people they otherwise would never have gotten to interact with. There's something that happens in our generation in particular where we get all of our news aggregated from a system that is in, in, entirely focused on bringing us the most alarming information there is. <laughs> that's what social media does. It brings to the fore everything that is the most alarming because that's what clickbait is. It's the craziest thing you'll ever hear. It's written that way. And so if you were to get all your information just from social media, you'd imagine that the world is a far worse place than it actually is. My grandma used to say something, and it was, um, it really forced me to think. I, she was my Egyptian grandmother, never got to go to school, raised six kids in a one-bedroom apartment. And I remember one time I'd stained my shirt. There was a small stain on it, and I said, the shirt's ruined. She looked at me and said, you're missing the whole part of the shirt that's not stained. And we have this, this culture almost of, of having lost our ability to nuance because all the information that's aggregated to us is so extreme. And we're so quick to tear down. But everybody on that campaign had the opportunity to engage people they otherwise never would have talked to. And the thing about people is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them and he created them beautiful. Even the worst people, there's beauty in all of them. And when you get to engage that beauty and you see it in somebody else, somebody you otherwise would never have even looked at, and you start to see that beauty because you're sharing a conversation about something that's really important to you, it moves you. It changes how you think about the world around you. It shows you your own ability to engage and move with somebody. And those things that seemed immovable, all of those things that you hear about awful people doing awful things, you start to see that people are actually quite nuanced. And you start to appreciate that you're actually quite nuanced. And those relationships that you built, they don't go away. That skill that you built to organize, that doesn't go away. And so to me, the things that keep me excited are the people in places that I never would have gotten to meet who showed me a part of themselves and who were willing to share a conversation about a future that they really believe in and were willing to invest in that future even if it just meant talking to a neighbor. And all of the young people, specifically from our community, who came out and said, you know, maybe I could do something different than I thought I was, I could do. And so to me, the, the thing, the optimism is to, to plug out of the things that show you the most alarming things in the world mm. and to start plugging into real people, whatever that means to you. Having a conversation with your neighbor who you might never have talked to, have a conversation with people at school that you might never have talked to, not your MSA click, right? To engage people outside of those communities Right? And start having conversations and finding the things yeah. that matter to you. I mean, that to me is the most important thing. And lastly, I'll echo the point. The hardest part about running for office is that you get your nefs beat down. Um, you're told all the time. I mean, you can imagine the, the, the and I know what kind of hate mail you get. Uh, but, you know, the, the kind of hate mail that comes and the, the kinds of, you know, fake news articles that start floating around about you and the, the way that people take aim about, around your family. And... Um, if you connect to the responsibility to serve beyond the pushback that you get in the work of service, then you start to realize that in the end, it's only your relationship to that work, which is ultimately your relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. And you wake up every day doing that work, asking yourself, well, what's my time here? Because in the end, I mean, you should just think about something for a second. All of us, kullu man alayha fan, all of us are, are gone. We're all going to die at some point. So if you think about it, all work is futile if that's the, if that's the worry. You're not going to be here for it all. But then you look at your kids and you think about their grandkids and you think about the beauty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you to have the opportunity to be a person of agency and a person of privilege to actually get to do something and make the world a different place for those kids. We actually named our first daughter Emily, my hope. And, um, and we named her that because, you know, for me, I'll tell you, the day after I lost, the, the most astounding moment was watching my nine-month-old kid look at me with a smile because she didn't know I lost. <laughs> she, did. she didn't. 
<laughs> I'm just her dad. Right, right. But that's why we do the work in the first place. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's, that's beautiful. I want to echo a couple things that you said. Um, I, as I've traveled the country, particularly over these past four and a half years or so of what we call the Black Lives Matter movement, I've now, I've now visited 40 states. Uh, I've um, visited almost now, almost 200 colleges and universities. I've written over the past four years, I've written over 1,500 articles about injustice and um, not just police brutality, but our criminal justice system, uh, even our economic injustice and even bigotry around the world. And it took me a couple years to understand this. I'm speaking specifically to the younger people in the room. It took me a couple years to understand this. And it, it took visiting all of those states, having thousands of conversations with organizers and activists to understand the point that I'm about to tell you. And I'm, st I'm stuck on it. And it's, it's something that I just have not been able to shake over the past year. For about the past year, when I would meet with organizers and activists across the country, they would describe for me the problems they were facing in their hometown or on their college campus or in their high school or middle school, in, in their neighborhood. And I would ask them, with no judgment, I would ask them, what's your plan for these problems? And I started noticing at first what I didn't know would be the answer that I would almost always get. When I would ask students or leaders or organizers or activists to explain their plan to me, often they would not have a plan. And sometimes when they would have an answer, what they didn't know that they were telling me is they were just wonderfully beautifully, expertly explaining the problem. They would just repeat the problem back to me in another way. And I had to say, no, I'm, but I'm, like with nothing but love and warmth say, no, I'm trying to get at what, what are your strategies, what are your plans for these problems? And it gets to something that you said, our social media, our news media, it mainly describes the problems. And most of us in the room, be it Islamophobia or bigotry, are literally experts on those problems. We could explain those problems better. This room has people who could explain those particular problems maybe better than anybody in the country. And I came to understand that we've spent so much time understanding the problem, and we've spent this much time thinking through the strategies and solutions for those problems. Here's why that puts us in a predicament where we're almost guaranteed to lose. Uh, I'm, I'm being, let me be political for just a moment. Republicans in this country control the House, the Senate, the presidency, now the Supreme Court, probably will have an even stronger majority on the Supreme Court by the end of this year. They control the state legislatures in the majority of states. They control the governorships in the majority of states. And that did not happen just because of happenstance or accident they strategized and organized themselves into those positions. When I look at the problem of police brutality or the problem of prisons, we have more people incarcerated in this country than not just any country in the world, but than any country in the history of the world. And it's incredibly complex. But then when I look at our plans for these really complex problems, you could normally fit our plans on the back of a napkin. They're too simple. They are earnest, well-intentioned, but we are often being completely overwhelmed 
by the massive sophistication of the problems that we're fighting against. Again, I'll circle back to where I, what I said earlier, part of why I still have hope is because when I look at our solutions, our plans, for whatever problem it is that we're facing, I look at them and I say, this, this is not good. This is not enough. It's not, the, the sophistication and complexity of our solutions has to match the sophistication and complexity of our problems. I'll, I'll close with this thought. I think, and it comes from a good place, many of us have thought that because we are right on most of the issues in society, we thought that because we're right and those who are doing us wrong are wrong, we thought that meant we would win. Being right and being victorious are not the same thing. Now, I don't want you to be wrong and win, but there is a way, there is a path for us to be right on the issues that matter and win. That's not where we are right now. We are right and losing way too often, and not because we're destined to lose, but because our strategy, our plans, our organizing is not at a, a level to get us to win. I think we're going in that direction. I think we're, we're growing in those ways. I, I, I know I, I've, I've participated over the course of this past year in five different races for governor. And I know as you look back, you are already saying, I would do this differently, I would tweak this, I would improve that. And we have to learn from all of our experiences and go back at it again and do better. And I want you to have hope again because we, we just have not thrown our, our best work, our best selves at our worst problems. And it, I'll close with what Sheikh Omar said is that showing up to the protest, it, it is better than nothing, but barely. That, is the, that should be the entry point to a sophisticated, complex strategy to solve our, our nation and our world's most pressing problems. And it can't be the beginning, middle, and end. It, it has to just be the entry point. And, and so I hope, as I, I hope to see many of you across the country over the next months and years, and when I ask you, hey, what's your plan? I'm expecting a really, I, I want you to look and say, are you ready to really hear what I have? Or I want you to say, actually, I have to send it to you. It's a 90 page PDF. <laughs> like, it, like it doesn't need to be a single page on a website. It needs to look like a book. It needs to look like the policies that you developed for your campaign, which were wonderful and complex and beautiful. It was literally, this was, it was the most beautiful, righteous, progressive campaign for governor that I've ever seen and the policies only a Rhodes Scholar could have, <laughs> could have, could have done what you did. Like, you, 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 you ran a beautiful, amazing, intelligent campaign and, and, and there's so much that we can learn from that and you created so many rich documents and policy positions that are going to be useful, not just for you, but for other leaders who see you and mimic that moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, can I just add something? Just very briefly, I wanna say that, you know, mashallah, I think that, that each one of us has, ha, each one of us has inherent abilities in them to serve in a capacity that is best for them. And I think that as we sit here on this panel that we hear in terms of a, of a collective movement, um, and I don't say this at all to discredit anything that, that was said prior to this, but I would also say that me personally, um, I grew up on an island, I grew up on the beach, I grew up around the water, so this idea, a very cliche idea of the starfish and the boy, you familiar with this? 
Like that, 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 that to me is a principle. The principle is that a boy is on the beach and all of these starfish have washed up on the shore. And, and he's picking up a starfish and he throws it in the ocean. He picks up a second one, he throws it in. He picks up a third and he throws it in. And a man comes to him and he says, look at all the starfish that are here. Like you, you, you know, does it, does it, you're just doing one, it's not really gonna make a difference. So he reaches down and he picks up a starfish and he throws that one in the ocean and he says, makes a difference for that one. He picks up another one and he says, makes a difference for that one. Now I say that because each one of us, if we're not gonna run for the governor of our state, or we're not going to have the type of platform that Sean has brought himself to through his, through his work or, 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 or Sheikh Omar or, 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 or our sister Dahlia, if, if, if just on a level, and, I, and I'll share this with you why I say this, because you talked about Uncle Rick, which I think I'd like to meet him. Because on Thursday, I'm, Friday next week, I'm leaving to Colorado for a bow hunt, an elk hunt, and I hunt myself. And the reason why I say that is because that single act right there has brought me into contact with people that we would run away from and be afraid if we saw them in the parking lot. And those same people are the same people that when I'm moving a house will show up at 7 a.m. with coffee and donuts while all the Muslims have excuses. So this ability to engage with people and allow them to see you as a human being first and foremost is our step to this door that opens up all of these things. Because now when that person can go back to his community, I'll tell you, I, was, I took a, when I was in New Hampshire, I was in Dartmouth, we hunted in Ohio, and I took a road trip with two Americans. <laughs> it was election day. It was Obama's second election. We woke up in the hotel room before we were about to go out to hunt. I didn't know what happened in the election. They got up before me. I said, you know, what was the result? He said, that's the worst day in American history. <laughs> but we got in the truck and we left. By the end of that hunt, that man said to me, brother, he was evangelical. He said, brother, he said, I'll hunt with you any time. Because you're a man of conviction, you have a book, and you have a religion, and you believe in it. And so it may be as simple as that, as engaging people on that level of humanity that then allows for the type of allyship that we're hopeful of because I'm not going to be an ally with you. This whole thing that we talked about, what Sean is talking about, and I feel that it's, 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 it's people acting out in self-preservation because this is a resource war right now. And those resources can be whatever you want to fill in for that resource. So if I feel that you are here challenging me to be able to take those resources before I can get them, then I have no need to be in allyship with you. But yet if we're working in a way that we see that there is enough for us to engage and move forward and then to stop the areas that are preventing that type of allyship from happening and that type of resource sharing to happening, now let's work together. Because now I know that we're both committed for the same thing. Have we done that as a community? Honestly, have we done that? Do we know people around us in, in, that, type of, in that type of knowing? So again, it's something for us to think about for ourselves. I want to donate my time to Sheikh Dawood, mashallah. How young? You said you got to look back on how young, so how young? Um, how young are we? This is a very not so young audience. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just trying to gauge the answer on that. Because I was thinking about it, I was like, you know, I used to watch The Simpsons. So what, what I would tell myself if I was a kid watching that episode where Donald Trump became president, like, this is actually going to happen. <laughs> and I thought it was a joke. Um, I obviously am going to sort of uh, piggyback off of what Sheikh Dawood talked about in terms of the spiritual element of this. Understand this as a believer. The chaos of this world is meant to drive you to the source of peace. And the chaos of this world is meant to drive you to become a source of peace. The chaos of this world is meant to drive you to as-salam, the source of peace. And the chaos of this world is meant to drive you to become a source of peace. I was, I've had a whirlwind of a trip over the last one month and a half. Um, and I'll tell you two stories from the refugees that, that I just visited. There's this girl that lives on the border of Syria. She's a Syrian refugee. She's 16 years old and her name is Rahaf. 
Rahaf can see Syria from her tent. She's been there for five years. Her dad had a heart attack and died in front of her in those tents. She goes out there and she works for one dinar a day, um, taking care of somebody else's crops just to be able to feed her family. And when we went to that girl and we said to her that we were going to bring her a home, you know what she said? She said, I don't want a home. I want to go to school. <laughs> like, they live in a tent. They don't have a bathroom. They get bit by scorpions. They don't have food and drink. And she said, don't bring me a house. I want to go to school. I was so blown away by that. And... I said, what do you want to be? You know what she said? She said, I want to be a lawyer. I said, why do you want to be a lawyer? She said, because I want to bring human rights charges against the dictators of this world. I was... I saw that girl and I was like, that's where Nasr comes from. <laughs> people like that, people like that are special people that Allah will bring about change through. And most people, if they walk through those camps, passing out food and drink and just dealing with people on a very superficial level, would just think she's just another refugee. I went to the Gaza refugee camps. And you know, Palestinians aren't going anywhere. They're just too stubborn. I mean, like, Palestinian refugees, you wouldn't even know they're refugees. You go to the Gaza refugee camps, these people live in, like, open sewage. And they look like the happiest kids in the world, they just don't care. I mean, it's unbelievable. And I met this girl that went to med school. Um, she, she, and this is Baqa'a in Jordan, like the worst Gaza refugee camps in Jarosh and Baqa'a. She worked herself out of that, went to medical school, and she had her medical school graduation party in the refugee camps because she wanted to inspire other girls as well. You see people like that and then you go, hope. I'm sitting here whining about whether or not I have a chance or I have an opportunity. There are extraordinary people out there. From an activism perspective and from a community approach perspective, let me tell you one of the biggest mistakes that we make as a community. We look for power to give us power. We think that if we suck up enough, and if we get invited enough, and if we get in enough photo ops, and if we get in with enough influential people, that we will be welcomed into the power structure. It's not happening, Muslim community. Get over it. That should not be our approach. That's not to say that we should not have a smart strategy in which different people do different things and we complement one another in our work. I'm not one of the... By the way, I, I cannot stand a person who does absolutely nothing in real life that sits online and tears everybody else up who does stuff in real life. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm not... This isn't to throw people under the bus. This is to say, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, هَلْ تُرْزَقُونَ وَتُنْصَرُونَ إِلَّا بِضْعَفَائِكُمْ are you supported or granted victory by God except for how you treat your most oppressed and vulnerable ones? Victory comes through the oppressed. Victory comes through the exploited. Because the character and the grit of those people like Rahaf, those are the people that will grow up to be our leaders. And we can't see them as a burden on our community. Let me tell you something. I mean... Can you just imagine if you saw Malcolm in prison? <laughs> Satan, his name was Satan, you know. Nickname was Satan. How many people would give Malcolm a second look from the Muslim community? You'd be like, thank God that guy didn't rob me. You'd look at him degradingly. You'd belittle him. You'd be condescending. If he was taken in a murder, an act of murder, like Stefan Clark was, you would say, well, he didn't give much value to society anyway. He wasn't that big of a deal. But look what Allah made of him. Look what Allah made of him. Somebody cared about him. Somebody saw something in him. Those homeless people that you step over when you go to your restaurants, when we go out to eat, 
Allah sees them and there's something in those people. Do not look down on the poor. Do not look down at the exploited. Don't look down on the oppressed. Something will come out of those people. It's been the history of our ummah. It's been the history of our deen, the history of our religion, the history of our people. The Prophet, peace be upon him, was not surrounded by powerful people. He was surrounded by strong people. And there's a difference. Bilal was not powerful. Khabbab was not powerful. Ibn Mas'ud was not powerful. These were slaves. These were people that were exploited. These were people that were oppressed. Look what Allah made out of them. And what did Allah say in the Quran to us? One of them, Stay patient and steadfast alongside those who are turned away from, who call upon their Lord night and day seeking His pleasure. You don't know where the help of God will come from. You don't know which of the seeds that you plant will bear fruit. You have no idea. You could invest. As a community, we could invest our entire strategy in working towards certain areas and for certain people and certain causes. And the victory of God comes from places that we did not anticipate at all. You have no idea which of your efforts will bear fruit. All you are tasked with is to keep on planting. That's it. Allah was in control in 2008. Allah was in control in 2016. Allah is in control in 2018. And you will never be in control. You are responsible for planting. That's where we get hope from. We don't get hope in you know, it, it, we don't get hope from the idea that we will one day control the outcome and the results. We find hope in the ability to work. You know, Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that, I don't concern myself with the answer to my supplication. I just concern myself with the ability to supplicate because Allah would not allow one to supplicate unless Allah desired good for that person. That's how we treat our good deeds. We don't control the outcome, but we work like we do. We don't control the outcome, but we work like we do. One more point on this, just for the, from, from the political perspective. Did y'all really think America just became a white supremacist government in 2016? No, I'm, I'm like, this is a system. This is a structure. I know George Bush does, you know, comedy tours now and, you know, celebrated as some sort of civil politician and statesman. But he started the, bo the, the bombing of Iraq. I mean, he, he did kill hundreds of thousands of your brothers and sisters. If you read the documents of John Ashcroft and Donald Rumsfeld, they were no less white supremacist or crusader-like <laughs> than Donald Trump's administration. And Obama dropped drones too. We can critique him as well, by the way. This has been a broken system for a very, very, very long time. And you know what? It's laid bare for us to work on it now. It's clear, laid bare for us to work on it now. Let's face it with confidence, knowing that Allah is in control and that he only burdens us with the effort. One more uh, story, which I think from a spiritual perspective, I'm just coming from Hajj, everything, I'm always thinking about Hajj after, Hajj. it takes a few months to get it out of your system at least, you don't want it to. But I was looking at the Kaaba and I was looking at the people making tawaf and I remember this incident. The Prophet, peace be upon him, sitting with his back to the Kaaba, re reclining on it in the worst time of his prophetic life. Meaning in this, when the Muslims were under the most intense persecution, He's sitting with his back reclined to the Kaaba to a point that if you saw him, you would think nothing is wrong. And that's what happened. Khabab, who was a slave who was beaten and tortured for being Muslim, he looks at the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his master took hot burning coal and put it on his head and burned the skin off of his back for becoming a Muslim. And he looked at the Prophet, peace be upon him, reclining back on the Kaaba, and he said to him, Ya Rasulullah, ala tad'u lana? O oh, Messenger of Allah, aren't you going to pray for us? Aren't you going to ask Allah to hurry up and bring about victory? 
And the prophet, peace be upon him, stood up and he said to him, there were people that came before you that were placed in the ground and sawed into two for their conviction. Don't be a hasty people. Don't be hasty. But I cannot come to start you doing, you're hasty. You're being impatient. He said that to a man that had the skin burned off of his back. None of us have had that happen to us. We should not be hasty, but we should work with a sense of determination and as if it is all in our hands. And we pray that Allah puts blessing in our efforts and at the end of the day that we are granted acceptance on the day of judgment. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum. So, one way to do something right now is to make sure that you are, if you are a Texas resident, registered to vote. So, uh, where are my, uh, my registers here? Where are they? Hands up. So, you've got people here who can help you get registered. How many of you guys from Texas? Raise your hand, please. All right. How many of you are registered to vote? Keep your hands up. All right. Fantastic. So, if you are not registered to vote and you would like to register to vote in the state of Texas... These good people over here are going to get you registered. One thing I just want us all to remember, don't complain if you're not ready to complain at the ballot box. So make sure that in that opportunity where you get to raise your voice, you get yourself in the ballot box, you get out to vote on November 6th. There are some great candidates here, great candidates across the country. Make sure you register to vote. So I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank our panelists, but I just want to say one thing. When Abdurrahman was speaking, he said, I lost and I lost big. Social scientists studying campaigns like him, his understand that what he was able to do was fundamentally change the narrative. Historically, it's been third party candidates who did it. From within the DNC, he was able to change the narrative on healthcare, on progressive politics, and move the needle in a way that we have not seen historically in, in, in politics. And his, and his name is Abdurrahman Muhammad Al-Sayed. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>